Or Dad <laughs> had Brother Suter back with us tonight. I'm going to get out of the way. Okay, Brother. Well, you all will. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, my brother. Actually, I don't even do that to my shampoo bottle. <clears throat> um, Ephesians, please. Great song. Uh, where is he? Did he write that? Oh, wow. I knew he played the guitar. I didn't know he was on the piano, too. Fourth member of the Trinity, is that what we're talking about? <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4. Nice job, Brother Sean. Uh, the Bible says here in verse 14. Find that? Um, that we henceforth be no more children. By the way, how many of you know, if you're raising little kids, aren't you glad when they get out of diapers? Aren't you glad when they can feed themselves? Now, I'm not talking about making the big mess all over the place, but actually kind of hit the hole from time to time. And aren't you glad... Finally, when they grow up. How many of you are in, uh, empty nest people? Isn't that good? There's just something good about that. Especially if you like your, if you like your life partner. <laughs> Tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Now, God's plan for all of us is to go on to maturity. And uh, <laughs> so tonight I would like to do something a little lighter. Um, I want to talk to you about biblically, and we'll be in mostly in Proverbs, biblically the three cars that are available to drive to maturity. By the way, how many of you remember your first car? Now, the light's kind of shining in my eyes. So, some of you older people, uh, what was the first car you owned? Remember that first car? Raise your hand and tell me. Back here in the back. A little louder. 1969 Yellow Beetle. <laughs> Most of the young people have no idea what you just said. Okay, did you hear that? 1969 Yellow, that's important, Beetle. Okay, what else? Yes. Yeah, 1964, Chevrolet Impala. Remember how that looked? Uh, red seats, and the car was black. Yes! <laughs> now, now, what was it about that first car? Now, mine was a 1950 Ford, black. Bought, bought it for $200. First car. Had that little bonnet on the front, remember? Windshield. Had to take that off. I didn't think that was quite speedy enough. Six cylinder, and um, you know, I wanted it to be a hot rod. You know, it's something about your first car. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, anybody got in the car, see, and it was black, and I wanted red on the inside. Uh, but being pretty poor, uh, I masked everything off and took spray paint. And I sprayed the headliner and the sides of the doors. Uh, you know, and it was real crusty when you touched it. But I really thought it was cool. And if you wanted to ride in my car, you got to take shoes off. <laughs> what was it about that first car? You remember your first car? So it was, you know what it was? Independence. I'm grown. I grow up, see. I got my own car. Well, so now we're into 13 grandchildren and five great-grandchildren. So one of our granddaughters, Victoria, she said, hey, Grandpa, pray for me. I'm going to go uh, take my test to get my license. Okay, Vic. I said, good deal. Wow, it's so exciting. Now, have you, have you gotten your book to study about the rules of the highway and stuff? No, not. But, you know, I've been to mom and dad. They, we've been driving for years. I think I've pretty well got this figured out. I said, well, okay. But now, just as this is a thought, why don't you just go ahead and pick up a book and glance through it? I said, now, when are you going to take your test? Well, it's going to be Thursday. I said, okay, now call me. Tell me how it turned out. So I get a call Thursday. Papa, oh, hey, Vic, how'd it go? Oh, well, I failed. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, what do you think went wrong? Well, 
I missed too many questions. Oh, okay, well, that's kind of normally how it works. Are you hearing me? And I said, now, hey, here's a thought. Uh, it's free, these books. They'll give you these books. They're free. And if you'll just kind of re read through that, they'll kind of brush up on the stuff that maybe you've kind of forgotten about. Okay. And uh, did she? No. I get another call this time. So she's going to take a certain date, and she didn't call me. I called her. Vic, how did it go? Papa, I failed it again. I said, okay. Well, um, now here's just a suggestion. <laughs> and bless her heart, guess what she did? Third time, charm. She got a book. Uh, by the way, God has given us a book. Right. Amen. And it's the instruction manual, How to Drive the Best Car to Maturity. Now, all of us are, that's God's plan for us. The whole book of Proverbs is designed to get a youngster into maturity. See? So, and I think I really need this. I have to kind of confess myself. So, with this um, six-cylinder Ford, 1950 Ford, um, you know, you want to be cool, right? So, I wasn't raised as a Christian. So, you drive in and out of, uh, back then, uh, uh, fast food places, hamburger places, where all the kids hung out. And I couldn't get my, my car with me. It was a six-cylinder. So I had to hold on the brake and really rev it up and then let off the brake. And that's about all I could get out of. But it sure seemed awfully important to me. So, uh, so I'm giving it gas, pop the clutch, or uh, pop the brake, fishtailed out of the hamburger place. Look who I am, look who I am. And somebody was there admiring my driving in uniform. And he just kind of flagged me over. It wasn't his first rodeo. And here I am. And I'm thinking, oh, my word. So I, I got a ticket. And I'm thinking, he's riding too slow because I had a curfew. I needed to be home. And it looks like I'm going to be in double trouble now. And so I, then I remembered, oh, yes, there's a shortcut on the way home. So I'm thinking, okay, the guy, I wish he could just ride faster. Finally gave him my ticket. I left. And then now I'm taking the shortcut. Well, guess what? So just within 20 minutes, I got caught in radar, speeding on my shortcut. Two tickets in 20 minutes. Now, most people, you would call that slow learner. Well, I came to the conclusion, okay, if you can't really beat them, what? You should join them. So I joined the police department so I could give out the tickets and not get the tickets anymore. Now, the book of Proverbs tells you and I, and I don't care what age you are, because, you know, you realize that a Christian could be saved 30 years, but I'm afraid in some circumstances you're, you're maybe still kind of in your teenage years as a Christian. God's plan is to move us to maturity. Now, there are three specific cars that you can drive to get to the maturity. So I want to introduce you to these cars, and let's try to figure out now, maybe tonight, what car you're driving. By the way... It's a big, there's a big issue with this whole thing. Um, you know what happens. Sometimes it takes a car wreck in your life to get you to realize that maybe your driving skills are not really what you thought they were. Get you to realize, okay, maybe I need to change cars. So here's the first one, if you'll go with me, Proverbs chapter 3. So the first car we're going to drive here is in Proverbs chapter 3. Now, I'm calling this car the car of Bible experience. Now, by the way, this is going to be the best car you'll ever drive. You'll get the best gas mileage out of this. It'll cost you the least. You'll get there quicker. And here's the description of the car. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Now, just stop there for a second. What, what is wisdom? See, now wisdom, catch this. Wisdom is seeing all of life situations from God's perspective. When you can take this Bible and a situation comes up in your life and you look at that situation like a set of binoculars and you can see what God sees about that, then I'm telling you, now you're headed for maturity. 
Does that make sense to you, what I'm saying? Yes. So the Bible says, Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Well, one of our daughters has a sign, three stair-step boys. And the sign says, uh, uh, Mistakes? Always make, thank you, all, it's my wife, always make new mistakes. Isn't that smart? Okay, you're going to make mistakes. How many of you know you're going to make mistakes? But it would be better to try to make a new one. Not the same one. This is the third time I've done that, Victoria. So always try to make new mistakes. So the scripture says, for the merchandise of this car of wisdom is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things that thou canst desire are not to be, uh, to be compared to her. Catch this, verse 16. Here's the promise, if you're going to drive this car. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. Oh, my word. What a car to drive. See? Now, you know what this really means? Well, look with me in John chapter 7. I want to slide over there for just a second. John chapter 7. How do you know if you're driving this kind of a car? Well, now this is the car of Bible experience. What do you mean by that, Brother Sitter? Here's what I mean. John chapter 7. Look in verse 17. The Bible says, If any man will do his will, God's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Now, here's our interpretation of that. Catch what it says. Obey, then you'll understand. Right. Isn't that what it just said? Obey, then you'll understand. Do you realize we're a generation and we're raising a generation? You say, uh, uh, son, would you go empty out the trash? And what do they say? Well, Why? It's, it's not full yet. No, no, that's really not what I asked. You see, we got that fishy smell that we just had for supper coming from something. So I'm saying to you this. Here's simple. Obey, then you'll understand. Now, our generation is one of those things. Well, let me understand why. And then I'll kind of logically figure it out. And then I'll, I'll uh, try this obedience thing. But now, I'm just telling you, that's going to head you for a car wreck. So what are we saying here? The most important car you can drive is when the scripture says something, take a deep breath maybe, keep your seatbelt on, because it might not seem logical, and it might not fit your emotions at the time, but just say, okay, if that's what it says, whew, then I'm going to do it. I mean, I remember breathing real heavy whenever I finally made the decision I'm going to do this Bible tithing stuff. Whew, almost took my breath away when I finally made the decision. But, and as I look back, can I tell you something? Oh, my word. Financially, that is the best car you will ever drive in your life. And there's a promise with it, see? Uh, the promise is, there in Malachi, that God will rebuke the devourer. I mean, really, can I be real frank with you? Everybody's going to tithe. <laughs> Everybody's going to tithe. If you don't give it to the right direction, Satan's going to come in and take it from you. Right. It would be much smarter, catch this now, this particular car, the car of Bible experience, you get in that car, you read it, and it says, you should do this. You say, whew. Well, that kind of goes against my logic. That goes against... Kind of how I was brought up and the way I always felt. Okay, but I'm going to do it anyway. Now that's walking by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right. Make sense? Okay, so I'm a young preacher enjoying the daylights out of the calling that God uh, uh, gave to me to pastor. And so uh, two good men in our church, sweet guys, I mean... Honest, hardworking, good guys. They contacted me after church and they said, uh, Pastor um, uh, Joe, 
He said, James and I uh, would like to meet with you. I said, okay, man, sure. We set up a time, they show up. I said, well, now how can I help you? He said, well, um, we've got a little bit of a conflict between us, and we've already purposed, we'd like to share with you uh, what's going on, and then we've already decided, you're our pastor, whatever you think is the right thing for us to do, we will do it. By the way, do you realize what just happened? Really, all I ever wanted to do was just preach the, the, the Bible, the gospel. Now, all of a sudden, I'm realizing there's two guys with a little conflict between each other. So who do you choose? You choose this guy, and this guy's going to get mad. You choose this guy, and the other. So I said, well, uh, okay, men, uh, what's the issue? So it's a pretty simple issue. It happened to be about a car thing, a truck. So Joe said, uh, well, you know, I'm a mechanic, and James came to me with his truck, and I had to overhaul the engine. And, and so I did. That's what I do for a living. So I did that on the side, charged him a less amount than it would normally cost, and, um, and, uh, and, I, and I gave the car back to, uh, truck back to James. James said, uh, and really I think, he, I think Joe did a good job. They were trying to be nice about this. But he said, you know, uh, four months later, uh, the engine blew again. And so it just seemed like it ought to last more than four months. And uh, Joe said, well, um, but even in my business, you know, there's only a 90-day uh, guarantee on it. And so there we are. And I'm thinking, oh, my word. I cannot walk out of here being the good guy. <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm sitting there, and while they're talking, and I'm seeing where this conversation is going, I'm praying. I'm offering up a prayer. I'm looking at him, but my mind and heart's not there. I said to the Lord, Lord, what should I do? I see where this is going. Now, I was shocked about this <clears throat> because offering up that prayer with my eyes open, by the way, when's the last time you prayed with your eyes open? It was always good to do it when you're driving. <laughs> but don't we get into such a routine? We pray before we eat. Have you ever tried... Praying after you eat? Now, the Jews did that a lot. Okay, another, another story. So all I'm saying to you is, so I'm praying, and just as clear as a bell, I got this illogical prompting that caused my, caused my heart to flutter a little bit. Here was the prompting from the Lord. I want you to, to me, I want you to sell your car, and the money you'll get from it will be enough to pay for labor to Joe and parts for James. And I'm thinking, uh, then that means I don't have a car. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> so here's what I was hearing the guys talk as I'm communicating with the Lord. Wah, 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 wah. I couldn't make a... <laughs> Oh, and I'm thinking, okay, first of all, that's really weird, Lord. And I, I, that doesn't sound very logical, but obey, then you'll understand. And so I'm thinking, how am I, how am I going to break this to my wife? Okay, I'm convinced. That's what I'm going to do. As soon as the guy's couldn't finish talking, I'm going to tell him. And, uh, well, how am I going to tell my wife? Boy, by the way, this is a test of spirituality in, in marriage. You know what I mean? The Lord prompts you to do something, calls you into the ministry, and you're sure hoping your wife's going to go with you. And, and by the way, they will. You just have to trust the Lord on these things. So, so I, I said, well, okay, fellas, now, um, I would like for us to keep this conversation private just here in this room. They said, okay, pastor, that'd be fine. I said, uh, I, I believe I know what the Lord wants us to do. Oh, they said, okay, what? And I said, well, now, the Lord told me I'm supposed to sell my car, and then we'll divide up the money, half for the labor and half for the parts. Oh, no, pastor. No, we didn't come in here for that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, the car of Bible experience isn't logical many times. 
and it won't fit your emotions, is all I'm trying to say. And I did kind of swear him to secrecy because I didn't, I got to think, now if the word gets out, then we may have to sell furniture and who knows what else, see, to solve some of these kinds. So I did. I mean, took our old car. It was a preacher's car. I mean, pulled it out to the curb by the church uh, property. Boom, that same thing sold in two days, just like that. Perfect amount of money for the parts and for the labor. And uh, so we agreed. We're going to tell anybody. So Sunday comes, and in between Sunday school and church, now, by the way, here's the whole thing. You see, if you're walking by faith, it may not make sense to you at first. What the scriptures have to say. Well, we've never done that like that before. I don't know if that really matters. If the scripture says, this is the way, walk in it, that's what you want to do. So in between Sunday school and church, a fellow came up, actually one of my deacons. He said, hey, preacher, he said, remember I told you sometime back that my uncle died? I said, yeah. He said, well, uh, I had the funeral, the reading of the will. Uh, he left me his car. I said, well, praise the Lord, brother. He said, and we were going to trade it in to get another car, but you really don't get much for trade-ins anymore. That was back there. And he said, uh, so my wife and I prayed about this. We would like to just give you the pink slip. You, you and your wife can have it. We know you only have one car. Maybe you'd like to have two. Little did he know. We're walking. And... Um, he said, or you can give it away, whatever you want to do. And I said, brother, thank you so much. And he said, we got the car out here. I went out and looked at it better than the car that I sold. <laughs> Are you hearing me? And then after church, couldn't hardly wait to get, you know, you're busy as a preacher. Talked to my wife around lunch. So as I'm headed over to the parsonage, another one of our men caught. He said, hey, preacher, we got a new car. I said, well, praise the Lord. He said, it's a good deal. And, and he said, I said, so what would you do, trade your old car in? No, he said, uh, you don't get much on a trade anymore. So he said, um, um, what, what, my wife and I prayed about this. And he pulled a pink slip title out of his pocket. He said, we just felt like we ought to give it to you and your wife. You only have one car. And, um, the, and you can keep it or give it away, whatever you want to. I said, where is that car parked? And we went over there, and I'm thinking, oh, my word. That's better than the first car I just was given. <laughs> now, how many of you know none of this is logical? But the Bible car is the best car. It's the car that will catch us now. You'll get the best gas mileage out of. It'll get you faster. Uh, there faster. And you don't have to. Uh, you don't have to experience something other than just the goodness of the God of God in the land of the living. Um, now, the truth of the matter is, over the years, the Lord in his kindness, I think just because of that one little seed that was planted, the Lord in his can kindness has given my wife and I 14 cars. You know, I kept thinking, Lord, do you want me to be a used car salesman? or Is, is the ministry not working for you or something? Now, here's all I'm trying to say to you. So... The best car you can drive is the Bible car right. to maturity. Now, maturity, catch this now. Maturity is seeing, what is maturity? Maturity is seeing the consequences of your actions further in the future than the people around you can. Right. Yeah. Amen. If you've got a teenager and that teenager doesn't always go along with the friends and what they say, ooh, You've got a little mature teenager on your hand. Maturity is seeing the consequences of your actions further in the future than the people around you can. <clears throat> Here's the second best car to drive. It's in Proverbs also. <clears throat> Go with me to Proverbs. Uh, where am I? Chapter 24. See in that Bible car, you can leave anytime you want to. You get the best gas mileage. You'll get to your destination faster and quicker than any other car you can drive. And here's the second car. It's, the, it's a good car, but it's the second best. It's in Proverbs chapter 24. 
And it starts in verse 31. Listen to what it says. Uh, verse 30, excuse me. This old boy says, I went by the field of the slothful. Now, what's a slothful person? Lazy. I'll put it off. Maybe tomorrow. Manana. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. Okay. And lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles and covered with the face thereof. And the stone wall there was broken down. Then I saw, catch this, and considered it well. And I looked upon it and received instruction. Now the second best car you can drive is to drive the car of somebody else's experience. See what I'm saying? In other words, look around you. Now, if you looked around today, you would see that six out of ten marriages wind up in divorce. If you looked ethnically, you would see that the ethnic groups that have the highest level of divorce rate also have the highest problems with criminal elements. You know why? Because dad's not there. The dad that says, no boy, that's not right to do. And can back it up. Now all I'm trying to say to you is, you look around, you see, quite frankly, you see what the majority of people are doing, and then you make a decision, I'm going to do just the opposite. Right. Uh, are you picking up what I'm saying? Yes. Because invariably, the more, majority of the people are wrong. Uh, So how many spies were there that spied out the promised land? Twelve. How many decided, nope, we can't go in? Ten, the vast majority. See what I'm saying? So you'll see that kind of over and over again. All those people that finally decided, Noah, maybe I would like to get in your ark because the stuff that you've been talking about is coming down. The majority of the people are wrong. Now you look around. God always works in the remnant. Not the masses. So he pulled out this one little family, Abraham, and he said, now I'm going to make you the father of the Jews. And you're going to be kind of a nobody. But the bottom line is, here was the promise. Whoever blesses you, I am going to bless them. This is huge. And whoever curses you, this is really huge, then I'm going to put a curse on them. Every time we have a presidential election, my first thought always is the same. Oh, my word. How is this new president going to stand concerning Israel? Mm -hmm. It's huge, by the way. If that new president, one of the first flights like President Trump did, boom, got on that plane, flew right over to Israel, met with their leadership, uh, uh, forged a strong uh, bond. Actually, he moved uh, the um, a little out. Thank you. The embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, where it should have been. See now, and all of a sudden, oh my word! See, so God said about His people, "Whoever blesses you, I'm going to bless them. But whoever curses you, I'm going to put a curse on them." Now. Do you have any idea why we're having such a problem here in the United States of America? This particular regime is not really in favor of Israel. And so, look around you. See what other people are doing that's wrong and decide, okay, I'm not going to drive that car. Now, that shouldn't be hard, should it? Uh, So, here's what the scripture says. Um, You look around and you see, okay... These people are training their kids a certain way. They're sending them to a certain educational institution. How are those kids turning out? And then you should say to yourself, whoa, I'm going to learn by the way they're driving that car. I don't think I want my kids to go there. By the way, how many of you know you just have one shot at raising kids? And we're all trying to do the best we can. But I'm just telling you, doing the best you can many times means you pull away from the herd and decide, okay, maybe I would just rather homeschool this youngster. 
If you can't afford Christian school, then make it a Christian school at home. Now, okay, so all I'm trying to say, you drive the car of somebody else's experience. Now, look, you can't take off anytime you want to because you kind of got to watch and see what's happening in their life. You might not get the guess, best gas mileage out of it. It's not as, best, as good as the first car, but at least it's better than this last car. Now, before I get to the last car, so one of our men in the church came to me, a school teacher, and he said, hey, preacher, good news. Pray for uh, my family and I. My wife's expecting. Oh, I said, well, praise the Lord. And I said, when's the baby due? Well, it's going to be about seven months. Okay. I said, well, praise the Lord. He said, now, I do have a prayer request. I said, okay, what's the prayer request? He said, well, um, you know, they had several children. So the car we have now is not big enough uh, for another seat in the car. Oh, I said, so you need a bigger car? He said, yeah. And I said, okay. Now, you know what I'm thinking. Well, I just experienced an unusual thing. By the way, we kept one of those cars and gave the other car away. So some months later, then here came the school teacher. And I said uh, to him, I said, uh, Brother Randall, have you ever thought about maybe just praying and asking God to give you a car? He said, uh, you mean, like, like, what do you mean? I said, well, like, God just give you a free car. He said, well, I guess I've never really thought about that. I said, I think you ought to think about it. Now, this was experience speaking. I didn't tell him that. And uh, because, you know, we need to walk by faith. You can't hitchhike off of somebody else's faith. You know, eventually you got to experience yourself. So uh, I said, I'm just, I would just encourage you to pray and ask God to give you a car. And he got a smile on his face. He said, why? He said, you know, that would be exciting, wouldn't it? I said, it really is exciting. And so he left. So he didn't need a car for what, six, seven months. I mean, a, a bigger car, six, seven months. So uh, every now and then, we'd, over the months, I'd say, well, hey, how's the car thing going? Well, he said, uh, nobody's given me a car yet. I said, okay. I said, well, uh, how long, far along? Well, you about two more months. I said, well, okay, you won't need a car until, for two months. Yeah, he said, yeah, I guess that's right. So about a month before the delivery, he comes in and he says, Pastor, guess what? I said, what? God gave us a car. I said, tell me about it. Sit down and tell me about it. He said, well, you know, we were driving by this car lot and everybody kind of looked over and they saw this station wagon. And all the family, the kids, everybody fell in love with it. We pulled in, checked it out. We bought the uh, station wagon. I, you know, what, what can you do? You rejoice with those that rejoice, and you mourn and grieve with those. That... I said, well, okay, well, well, praise the Lord. Well, so you've got that settled. He said, yes. Now catch this, two weeks later. I told you we were given 12 cars. Two weeks later, here came one of our families. They said, uh, hey, pastor, um, you know, we got another car. We, we don't need as many cars as we have. And uh, so we prayed about it, pulled a pink slip out of his pocket and said, uh, want, to, want to give you this car? I said, what kind of car is this? So we went out there. This car was as long as from here to the row of seats. I said, how many people can fit in that? Well, a lot more people than we want to fit in it. I'm just saying to you, catch this. See what I'm saying? Wouldn't it? I just wished... I wish he waited just a couple more weeks. He didn't need a car, a bigger car yet. Just wait just a little bit. Now, here's what you want to realize. God's will and God's timing are the same. God tells you something, then okay, accept that. Praise God. But don't kind of force his hand in the timing. Then I want it in a week. No, I don't do that. See, because God's timing and God's will... They're really the same. Now, I couldn't go to him and say, oh, brother, let me tell you what you missed. That's kind of, I gave that car to another family in the church. They drove that thing for years. 
got more mileage out of it than you can believe. Now, all I'm saying to you is we're all driving cars to maturity. Don't make decisions based on what society is saying. Don't make decisions based on what your feelings are drawing you toward. Be careful with that. Don't make decisions based on what you think is logical. Well, this just seems logical. Don't do that. The second best car is you look around you and you see what people are doing, the most of them, and you say, uh, maybe that's a signal I shouldn't be going in that direction. Now, how many of you are picking up what I'm saying here? Does this make sense to you? The third car. Well, it's kind of the worst car, quite frankly. It's in Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Now, while you're getting there, I will tell you this. You've got to be real careful because I think Satan is one of the slickest car salesmen I've ever seen in my life. He's going to use subtlety and deception to get you to get into a car that God never wanted you to get into. And I'm not talking necessarily literally, but maybe I am talking necessarily literally. He's going to cause you, tempt you to move into a relationship and try to drive that relationship car that God never intended you to drive. So be careful with this. Here's the worst car, third car. It's, and I'll tell you what it is. We're reading in Proverbs chapter 3, starting in verse 5. But here's the car. Worst car you can drive is the car of your own experience. Now here's what the scripture says. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. That's what we've been talking about. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now catch this. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. So I'm a policeman, and I'm a Christian, and I'm really trusting the Lord. By the way, you know, where I worked, it was a kind of a life and death situation almost every call you went to. And um, so I was always asking the Lord, help me with this and help me with that. And we'd go in on a, you know, like midnight, one o'clock in the morning warehouse, the silent alarm went off and somebody's in there. I'm just telling you. It was just like that. And uh, because I was communicating with God and asking him to help me and prompt me about things, I began to see some real unusual supernatural things take place. I mean, I would get a call on the radio. It would be a block and a half away, a robbery in progress. So, man, you don't do red light and siren if it's in progress. So you rush over there as quick as you can with the red light. No noise. And I pull up, and here's three guys coming out of this uh, store carrying money and weapons. I pull up. I jump out of the police car chuk, chuk, with a shotgun. Drop your guns. And they did. I was kind of as shocked as anybody, I guess. <laughs> and on the ground. And they did. And pretty soon, it was just stuff like that every time I turned around. And pretty soon, it, it was pretty exciting because the Lord and I kind of had this little thing going. I was trusting him. I was asking him for help. And just every time I turned around, right in my backyard, something was happening, see? And pretty soon, I got kind of a reputation on the police force. And somehow, that reputation uh, set up some pride. So the S on my shirt didn't stand for suitor anymore. Stood for what? Superman. <laughs> Super cop. And so <clears throat> I began to think, well, things are going so well here. The Lord and I must be pretty tight. And so I just kind of stopped uh, really including him on my everyday calls and stuff. Mm. Now, we're talking about driving. We're talking about driving cars to maturity. So I remember it was about 11 o'clock at night, and it had been raining, hilly part of Kansas City, Missouri. <clears throat> it was in the fall, leaves were on the tree, uh, 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 from the tree were on the ground, 
And I get this call. And it was a call that I had to do red light and siren. So I'm going too fast. I didn't ask the Lord to help me. I just, it was one of those, the S really stands for maybe Superman. I pop over this hill. And when you know it, there was a brand new white Cadillac parked at the curb. And I almost missed that Cadillac. I mean, I was going too fast. I plowed right into the rear of that Cadillac. About that much of it. Oh, I couldn't believe it. Make you, have you ever been in a wreck? Yeah. Now look, a wreck will adjust your theology. And, and some other things. Your wallet, your bank account. And so, I said, oh. But, you know, then I got to looking at things. Because that's a sudden stop. Metal crashing, and I jackknifed that Cadillac on the curb over there, on, kind of going downhill. Then I noticed, oh, there were two cars in front of that, and that car smashed, Cadillac smashed that car, that car smashed the other car, and my car. That's four cars, kind of right there. And the Cadillac was out on the, on the sidewalk, and I thought, oh, my word. And I got on the, it, it's just, you know, unless you've been there, you never understand what I'm saying. Uh, 20, uh, 2314, come in 2314, and I'm realizing, oh my word, now the Cadillac's still moving. It's out on the sidewalk now, and it's moving down the street. Uh, 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 hang on just a second. And I ran over to the back of that Cadillac, full uniform, grabbed the bumper <laughs> so it wouldn't go where it wanted to go. Now, how do you think that worked? It did not work. That's a heavy car, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that. And so I'm just standing there thinking, oh, my word, I can't believe what's happening. Now, the Cadillac starts down the sidewalk, and then it kind of, a little bankment, and it starts across the street. And I'm looking across the street. Oh, no. There are two cars parked over on the other side of the street. And I'm thinking, no, Lord, please. Now, see, all of a sudden, you get real spiritual in a crisis, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lord, please don't let this happen. Oh, yeah. Right between the two cars, clipped both of them, bam, bam. Oh, and I'm thinking, oh, 2314, come in 2314. Now I'm noticing that the Cadillac is now on the sidewalk across the street after damaging both those cars, headed down to the intersection. <laughs> oh, this is terrible. <laughs> so, and I, you know, have you ever seen wide eyed? <laughs> there I am. And this is just pitiful. And now we're talking about driving cars to maturity. So I'm looking down at the intersection. This is late at night. And no intersection, no traffic. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, I wonder if it's going to hit a tree or a post or something like that. And then when you know it, here come a brand new red cutlass pulling up to the intersection. He had the red light. But he heard all this metal crashing and bending. And so I could see him. He looked like this, up the hill and he saw this big Cadillac coming his way. Now the light had turned green. Uh, well, I just wished he would have went on but he didn't. Guess what? White Cadillac crashed into that car. I don't know if you've been counting. <laughs> Seven cars. One man. The guy with the S. <sighs> Seven car pileup. Now look, you know what Satan will want to do? He'll want you to have more confidence in yourself than you should. He'll want you to wing it. He'll want you to think that the Bible mandates and the truths are old-fashioned. Well, that might have fit back there in the Holy Land days, but this is the 21st century. Oh, of all the time on the planet, they fit now. Are you hearing me? Now, what am I trying to say? Look. Every one of us here tonight are in one of these three cars driving to maturity. And you young people especially, now catch this, be real careful the car that you're driving. Some of us old people, because of wrecks, we've decided somewhere along, usually a wreck will do that. Oh, I think I need to change cars. Maybe I shouldn't listen to what everybody else is saying. Maybe I just ought to... See what the Bible has to say and get in that car. It's the best car. Now, here's the conclusion today. Satan will try to slip in there through your emotions or your logic and 
jerk the wheel into oncoming traffic. It happens in relationships when you're driving a car of relationships. Be careful with that. It'll happen when you're trying to raise kids. You'll think, I'll overlook it this one time. It's not a big deal. But it is a big deal. It'll set the stage for more car wrecks down the road. Now, my question to you tonight is this. What car are you driving? Every one of us is going to be driving one of these cars. And maybe you've had enough uh, relationship wrecks or car things in your life that you're thinking, you know, tonight maybe I ought to trade cars. Maybe I ought to stop driving the car that I'm driving. Maybe I ought to trade cars. Now, that would be one of the smartest mature things we could do. Father in heaven, I know this is light tonight, Lord. But it's the truth, straight from your word. <sighs> Obey, then we'll understand. Obey, then we'll understand the best car we can drive to maturity. 